Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you about something today that will probably ruffle some feathers, will probably be controversial to a lot of people. If you've seen my show in the past, that's probably not a surprise at all. It's probably expected at this point. But nonetheless, it's been something that's been on my mind for a while. There's a reason why I, t- I titled this show Fatima, Garibandal, and Medjugorje, The Dangers of Private Revelations, um, because I really want to touch on those issues as a jumping point or a starting point for the conversation. But please don't take this show as a deep dive into any particular apparition, but instead using the reality of private revelations as something to discuss. So, first and foremost, we should probably define what a private revelation is. Well, simply put, we have public revelation in the church. That means we have the deposit of faith in Scripture. Those are the things that we have to believe or believe in uh, to the degree that the church tells us to believe, and obviously there's debate about the parts of Scripture. But nonetheless, we have to believe that Scripture is revealed by God, and we have to believe that the uh, deposit of faith found in sacred tradition is also part of the revelation that came to us from the apostles. Those things we have to believe. All other private revelations are just that. They're private, meaning they're not part of the public revelation. They're not part of those things we just discussed. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how uh, geopolitically important they are. It doesn't matter how sociologically significant they seem. For one to be saved, it is not necessary to believe in or act upon any particular private revelation, whether that be something approved like Fatima, whether that be something like Garibandal, which is not approved, although I am starting to come around on that one. I'm not going to make it the cornerstone of my faith, but I am starting to believe that it's probably legit. Um, Or whether that be something like Medjugorje, which is clearly not approved and is controversial to say the least. Ultimately, the way that we go to heaven, we die in a state of grace. In order to die in a state of grace, we have to attend the sacraments. We have to keep the Catholic faith in its entirety to the best of our knowledge and God will judge us based on what we could possibly know. Private revelations sometimes are very useful to people. And in my experience and observation, I think sometimes they can actually be really harmful to people. I'll explain what I mean. If we look at the history of the approved private revelations in the church's past, we find revelations that come with a very important significance for a particular reason in the church's history. Let's take, for example, the uh, tradition surrounding the rosary revealed to St. Dominic. If you actually look to what was going on at that time, there already was a rosary-type prayer that came from the Psalter. Uh, you know, the rosary is traditionally called the Marian Psalter, meaning praying the Psalms is the Psalter, so that's why there's 150 prayers in a full rosary, there's 150 Psalms. There were aves and things like that as far back as we can tell. But the rosary that we pray today, which we would, I think, technically call the Dominican rosary, this was revealed to St. Dominic, as the tradition tells us, and that's where the mysteries come along, the mysteries that we pray with every decade. And there's a point to that. The reason is, is because at that time, they were dealing with the Albigensian heresy. They were dealing with the Cathars, which were essentially a group that promoted this type of Albigensian heresy. What did this Albigensian group believe? This group basically believed that there we were, it, was, it was sort of a reincarnation of this Manichaean heresy that was, a to, that was around at the time of St. Augustine, which basically denied that material things created by God were good. It was a Gnostic heresy, and there was sort of the denial of the goodness of the body. So, in order to combat that heresy, these mysteries attached to the rosary which are all incarnational or have to do with the body, if you think about it, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the birth of Jesus, um, you know, the presentation of our Lord in the temple, which actually has to do with, the, with, with surrounding the rituals for, for infants at the time, which included things like circumcision, uh, the resurrection of Christ in the flesh, 
um, the assumption of Mary body and soul into heaven. All of these things are incarnational, meaning they have to do with the body. If we think about the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the scourging, the crowning with thorns, etc. All of this has to do with the actual physical events in part as part of salvation history are part of salvation. They're necessary. There's an incarnational aspect. This was to combat a heresy. Not only was the private revelation important for the piety of the people that um, were around to hear about it or to see it, it actually played a role in the health of the church. We might go to, for example, um, Our Lady of Good Success, which is technically called Nuestra Señora de la Purificación, uh, de Buen Suceso de la Purificación, which uh, loosely translated, we call it Our Lady of Good Success, but really it should be called something like Our Lady of the Good Event of the Pur Purification, but it doesn't really get called that in English. But nonetheless, there, there were stark warnings to um, uh, M M Mother Mariana, who was the visionary, and Our Lady appeared to her over a series of decades, and Our Lady made predictions that actually didn't come true for a really long time, uh, for some of them, some of them did. Um, but some of them didn't come true for a really long time, and it touched on the impending disaster of Freemasonry in the church, which is, of course, at the heart of the crisis in the church that we're in today. And we could think of other examples, and we could move to La Salette, Akita, um, Our Lady of Fatima, of course. All of these are part of the actual health of the church. Heaven is giving us something to understand so that we can navigate through these dangers to the faith so that we can keep our faith. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe is an important example. Obviously, you know, the conversion of pretty much all of the native Latin American peoples, at least in Central America, largely hinge, hinges on this apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And there was a physical aspect there as well, if you think about it, because there was an actual apparition of roses that were real. Um, there was a physical sign left by Mary with the tilma, with the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Personally, Our Lady of Guadalupe was the most important, is the most important apparition in my life, and I owe my Catholic faith to a conversion, an interior conversion. I was a baptized Catholic but wasn't practicing uh, in Mexico City, visiting the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. But as important as all of those apparitions are, it's not actually necessary for a Catholic to believe in those apparitions in order to save their souls. Now, it would be very imprudent to disregard them after they've been approved, of course. Um, it's not a good thing to say, you know, to heck with that Guadalupe apparition. That's not a good look because this is something that's approved by the church and it's part of the church's history and it's clearly part of the, um, you know, evangelization and conversion of the new world, so to speak, which has been massively important in the church's history. So I'm not saying that any Catholic should disregard it. I'm just saying Catholics lived before Our Lady of Guadalupe, and they died and went to heaven. And there are Catholics around the world who maybe have heard of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but don't live in the Western world. Maybe they're African. Maybe they're living in, in uh, the Philippines or something like that. And, and of course, they have a Marian piety, but it's not something that's culturally significant to their Catholic history. Therefore, it's not really something that they've ever really paid attention to. But nonetheless, that's not what gets them to heaven. What gets them to heaven is keeping the faith. All of this is to say that apparitions, whether they're of the Virgin Mary, angels, St. Joseph, apparitions of Jesus, if these things are legitimate, they're given to us from heaven so that we can keep the faith. They're given to us so that people can convert to the faith. And then, of course, they have to live and die with that faith. If at any point an apparition becomes the whole of your faith, especially an unapproved apparition, if at any point your piety, your belief, your faith practice, if you want to call it that, necessitates or relies on, to a large degree, any given apparition, then we get into some very murky waters. I want to call to mind one of the things that Christ said in the scriptures. And he said, I'll paraphrase, but a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. Now, people will say that I'm using that out of context because 
everyone you disagree with, of course, doesn't use the Bible in context. That's how that trope usually goes. But the reality is, is that Christ, is, Christ says that a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. And why is that? The reason is, is because although we have a certainty, we have certainty in the faith, to have faith is to, in some ways, believe things or believe in things that you know to be true without seeing them. And we look to the Old Testament and we find this. One of my favorite examples is when it's part of the various moments when Abraham is told he's going to have offspring and things like that. And at one moment in the scriptures, you actually find Abraham being told, I'm paraphrasing here, but he's being told essentially that he's going to have offspring more numerous or as numerous as the stars. And then he goes out and looks at the sky. And then it says, after that, the night fell. And, and the point of that is he's told by God, by an interior locution or the voice of God, however it, however it happened, to go look at the heavens and he knows the stars are there, but at that moment he can't see them. And this is God telling Abraham, you can't see the stars, but you know they're there. You can't see your offspring, but when it's time, they will come just like the stars will become visible to you. And Abraham never saw his offspring as numerous as the stars. In fact, he only ever had one, I think, one legitimate child. Of course, he had Ishmael with Hagar. But um, it was clearly a promise about something that he would never see yet he believed it as real, so real, in fact, that he would trust God even to the point of being willing to sacrifice his only son, his only legitimate son. Moses never got to the promised land. Other examples can be found in scripture as well. For us as modern day Catholics, we do live in a time of a great lack of faith, both in the church and in the world. We live in a time of great crisis of faith, of course, in the church. So it does make sense and it is natural that people would gravitate towards private revelations, whether they be from mystics, visionaries, apparitions, and so forth, as something to nourish their soul because they're not usually getting what they need in order to be um, formed and fed in their spiritual life in their parishes. But... The devil uses good things to damn our souls. It's a good thing to be excited about a Marian apparition. It's a good thing to be excited about some of the wisdom found in mystics. But it's not a good thing to make our entire faith about those things. You know, when I look around at the world of apparition chasing, I'll call it, I see a lot of people, I think, and I'm not trying to judge here, I'm just trying to say what I observe. I see a lot of people who their faith largely hinges on consistent messages from prophets who are not approved by the church, consistent messages from visionaries who have visions that are not approved and sometimes even condemned by the proper authorities. And sometimes people need consistent and constant messaging from heaven as part of their spiritual life. I mean, how many people have signed up to get the daily updates or weekly upda updates from Medjugorje? Do aside from the fact whether or not that apparition is legit or approved, that alone, I believe, is extremely disordered. How many people have listened to unappointed, unelected, end times prophets who are all are consistently talking about, you know, this big thing is around the corner. You know, this is when this is going to happen. Look, it's, it's here in this life of the mystics, of this mystic of the church, and this is what that means. No one really has the authority or the expertise to make a statement like that, even priests, even popes in many cases. But for some people, this becomes essentially the entirety of their faith or a huge part of it. And as I said, I think there's a huge danger in that because the reality is, is that virtually every single end times prophet that's ever existed, well, not virtually every, every single one has been wrong. 
anyone who's ever said the apocalypse is coming has de facto definitionally been wrong because the apocalypse hasn't come. Now, obviously, we could point to Scripture and, you know, Christ gives us prophecies about what the end times will be. Of course, he's right. <laughs> but the actual chronological time of those comings, and there have been saints who have been convinced that they're in the end times. But it didn't happen. Some of the greatest uh, and most important uh, priests and activists, or whatever you want to call them, Catholic spokesmen of the last century have been convinced that the end times are around the corner and they never came. Of course, at some point, someone who predicts the end times will, by the laws of chance, be correct. And at that point, you know, they can all say they were vindicated. I get that. But as a rule, it doesn't happen. How many people have agonized over the impending three days of darkness, which is not a teaching of the church as much as people want to throw rocks at people who disagree with that. It is not a teaching of the church. There are various prophecies that point to something like that, but there is no teaching of the church that says we have to take those things literally, or we know exactly what they mean, or the days are actually literal, or when that will or will not come. How many people are waiting for various seals to be opened? How many people are uh, looking at prophecies about, you know, at what point a great monarch will come, or at what point a pope that's going to restore things is going to come, or when is the papacy going to end, etc. And again, all of these come from a good place. But personally, I think if Our Lady, if the Virgin Mary truly appeared, which I know she has in many cases, I don't think she would be comfortable with this phenomenon of people focusing intensely over and over again on the apparitions themselves rather than her son. And the reason I say this is because one of the only things Our Lady says is the Magnificat in the, in the New Testament. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. If we look to Mary, we should see Jesus more. That's the way that she wants it. But if we look at some of these supposed apparitions and we're really more focused on geopolitical events or the crisis in the church or the debatable interpretations of various writings of mystics, supernatural phenomena that we're waiting for, although this comes from a good place, in many cases it might actually be encouraging us to look away from Christ and towards something that's not even a teaching of the church. Now, none of this is to say that there are not reasons to take certain apparitions seriously. I've written extensively in the past about Fatima. I think Fatima is super important. I think that the aspect of Guadalupe, where she's standing on the crescent moon, which, which um, is part and parcel with her role in the Battle of Lepanto fighting the Muslim Ottoman Empire, I think that's super important to understand. I think we should look to Our Lady of Good Success and understand how Our Lady was warning us about the dangers of Freemasonry. All those things are important. Akita, talking about bishops versus bishops, versus bishops, cardinals versus cardinals, and so forth. We could keep going. These things are important, but knowledge of these things will not save our souls. If we spend more time watching YouTube videos for updates about when the warning might be coming than we do reading the scriptures or spending time in mental prayer, etc., then we've got a problem. This doesn't mean they're exclusive, but I'm just saying that that does happen a lot. Also, a lot of the time we find that people who are deep into the Novus Ordo world have a huge emphasis on these apparitions, yet they're willing to accept and participate in some of the greatest sacrileges the church has ever seen. I mean, let's think about that just for a second. We're obsessed with whatever apparition, but we attend a parish every Sunday where Jesus Christ is handed around like cookies or a piece of pizza in the way that the Eucharist is, is distributed, or the preaching is basically heretical. You know, 
we could continue with examples. But my point is, is that apparition or the interpretation of that apparition or the chasing of more and more and more revelations and apparitions, is that actually informing a Catholic sense? Because if it was, you'd think that we'd have a revival amongst the apparition crowds of traditional Catholic piety because it's the traditional Catholic dogmas and liturgies of the church that have been part of the church for all times and have been how Catholics were saved. In addition, in a lot of these unapproved apparition worlds, and again, I am starting to come around on certain things with Garibandal, so don't take my meaning for that one. I'm, I'm pretty convinced about it, to be honest, at this point. Uh, not that I'm, again, going to change my life over it, but nonetheless, I think it's, I think there's a very good chance it's legitimate. But in a lot of these streams of people chasing these prophecies and revelations and things, it's just simply not the case that Catholic orthodoxy is a given. There are plenty of people who, there, are, there, there is plenty of, uh, you know, dogmatic confusion in these crowds who are chasing these apparitions. And you'd think that if something was actually from Our Lady, that it would inspire people to pick up the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Don't get me wrong. You know, people might say, well, what about all the good fruit of this apparition or that apparition? I mean, Our Lady supposedly is telling us to pray the rosary. Listen, praying the rosary is wonderful. But if you pray the rosary and die in a state of mortal sin, it's all for naught. If you pray the rosary and die a heretic, it's all for naught. Now, the argument there would be, if you keep the rosary, it's very unlikely you'll keep your mortal sins. And that's true. But we have to also understand that it's very possible that Satan could use unapproved or bogus or, or fake or deep fake apparitions as a way of slowly leading us to perdition while giving us the impression that we're actually on the right path. The, de the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. That's clear in scripture. And this will be the last thing that I think I want to bring up. We're now living in a time where the threats of artificial intelligence and the deep fakes that are possible, we've seen this. I mean, you saw the images perhaps of Pope Francis that were fake and they looked completely real. And this is, you know, they've, they're at the point where they're making artificial intelligence, uh, you know, pornography and people can't tell the difference. What fertile breeding ground is this tendency to chase apparitions for Catholics to be confused by private revelations? Sorry, by artificial intelligence that's giving us a supposed private revelation. Maybe that's, maybe that's a little bit out there, but if we're always looking for a sign, we're now in a position in history where you can make indistinguishably indistinguishable signs that look completely real, but just simply aren't. You know, I remember, I think it was in 2021, there was something going around on the internet. It was called Countdown to the Kingdom. I never looked into it much, but I, I did look into it a little bit. What was the countdown for? Did the kingdom come? What did that mean? I'm just asking. You know, at a certain point, when we chase these apparitions and we chase these phenomena and make this sort of the cornerstone of our faith, but it never comes true, how often are we going to be moving the goalposts? I don't know. I know what I've said is probably going to upset some people, but the only reason I say it is because... You know, I've been deep in the Fatima world, and, I've, and Fatima is an approved apparition, which is completely legit. But I've seen people's obsession with Fatima be super unhealthy for them. And that's a real apparition that we know is real, and that has been approved by the church and by, you know, signs seen by tens of thousands of people at the same time recorded in newspapers and so on and so forth, by journalists taking pictures, etc. You know, there's no doubt that Fatima has been verified. But I've seen people deeply involved 
in the Fatima movement, uh, but have very unorthodox beliefs, very disordered Catholic uh, perceptions on things, um, and there's really no holiness to be found in some cases. That doesn't mean that that's what it brings, but what I'm saying is, if we think about this journey to heaven as being on a ship, which we know it is in a sense, because this is the bark of Peter, it's Noah's Ark that we're on, you know, getting across the waters. We only have to be off by a half a degree. Because if you're off by half a degree over a lifetime, then how many hundreds or thousands of miles away from the destination will you be by the time you get there? As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Don't shoot the messenger. Just take what I've said as something to consider. And if you want to let me know how you feel, you can sign up for our email list in the um, show notes and you can send me a nice or a nasty email. It's up to you. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.